morning. Mark has been in Philippians now about 18 weeks, I think, something like that. And uh, others have kind of come along and taught from time to time. But I'm excited to be able to share with you one of my favorite books. And it truly is. I'm not kidding. One of my favorite books. I had a teacher many years ago named Daniel DeHaan. My second son, Daniel, was named after him. And he was a Bible teacher, and he loved Paul and taught me to love Paul as well and taught out of Philippians a whole lot, and I learned a great deal from him. Now, last week, Mark uh, introduced us to the idea that in the book of Philippians and the, and, the, and the few verses that he was talking about, that joy is the distinctive mark of what it means to be a Christian, unmitigated untrammeled. I'm not sure what that word means, but I like it. Uh, I, no, I actually do know what it means, but I haven't heard it very often. Unrestrained joy. Now, that's, that's who we are to be. That's, that's Paul's prescription to us, right? He's not saying, well, it might be good if you had a little more joy in your life. It might be good if you had a little more happiness and joy in your life. No, he's saying, no, as your apostle, he says, rejoice. And there's something in the rejoicing that begins to be infectious as people around you rejoice as well. And so he is the super joy apostle or something. And I'm, I'm, a, I'm just so thrilled that we today get a chance to sort of weigh into that just a little bit as well as Paul moves toward uh, something else. So if there is a, if there is a, a title to today's, it's going to be this. It's watch me. Now that's not me, that's Paul saying watch me. And when we get to that, I'll show you exactly what I'm talking about. Because it is a crucial part of Christian formation. It's a cru crucial part of who we are in Christ to have other people and to know that other people are watching us and to be watching the right people and to be paying attention to the right people. We'll talk about that a little bit more. So Paul says essentially in this passage today, Philippians 4, 7, 8, and 9, somewhere in there, he talks about watching me, the things that you have learned from me, the things that you have seen in me, the things that you have received from me, the things that you have heard from me, do those things, and the God of peace will be with you. It's a great promise but it's also an important mandate for us as we talk about it together. All right, here's our passage. The, the first part of the passage, Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. Yeah, I've, I've never played with this screen before. Can I play? I can do, it. I can do this, right? All right, finally, brothers, and, and Paul, has, uh, Paul has already talked about this word finally, and, and Mark has talked about it, so I'm not going to get too much into it. But finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is just, Whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, and there is, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep thinking about these things. Fix your mind on these things. Paul understands that what we do with our minds is very important. The mind is not neutral ground. Paul is saying, fix your thoughts on what is true, what is commendable, what is honorable, what is pure. Fix your thoughts there. Which begs the question is, what have you been thinking lately? How have you been thinking lately? Well, as we get into this, here's the thing. What do you think about? What do you think about most? What do you think about day after day. Now, you can't control everything that you think, I have to admit. The other day I was in the house and a bird flew into my head. My first thought was, there's a bird that just flew into my head. How did the bird get in there? Now, I couldn't control that. That was just something that happens. You can't control. But Martin Luther said it this way, you can't control the thoughts that just sort of fly over your head like a bird but you can keep them from building a nest in your hair, right? You don't have to keep thinking about that. I didn't sit down and ponder for 30 minutes. You know, there's a bird in my house. I wonder how that happened. What I did is I just, and the bird kept flying into the ceiling fan. 
just kept going around. Bam, bam, bam. I felt bad for the little guy. So guess what? I turned it off. Pretty smart, right? PhD. Right? So turned it off, was able to sort of corner the bird because I couldn't get him out the door. But I, I finally threw a towel around and picked him up very gently and, and took him outside. Now, that, that's a part of our thinking during the day, but take a look. Experts estimate that we have between 60 and 80,000 thoughts every day. That's about 2,500 to 3,000 every hour. Not quite one a minute. Well, see, no, there would be one a second almost. I mean, that, that's a lot of thoughts. Thoughts are always going through here. So the question is, where are those thoughts coming from? What informs your thinking? What's happening to our thinking as Christians, as followers of Christ? What informs your thinking? Is it social media? I mean, I tell you, every place I go, um, I was on a bus the other day going to an airport, and everybody was there doing this, right? How many hours of screen time did you have last week per day? Everybody's doing this. Students come out of classes, and instead of talking to each other and talking about the game or talking about this kind of thing, everybody, when they get up, they do this. And they're walking around this. So I'm wondering to what degree is social media and technology informing our thinking? And that's not neutral ground. There's agendas at work, as you well know. Is it television? How much TV do you watch? How many hours of TV do you watch? What do you watch on television? Does that inform your thinking? Does that creep into your thoughts? My wife's dad passed away this summer. Clyde Hall, he's 94 years old. And uh, Clyde watched television to be entertained. Just to be entertained. He wanted to have entertainment, so he watched TV. And if he ever got the idea that, that somebody was trying to get something over on him, he would say something like, I think they're trying to teach me something. That show's trying to teach me something. I don't like it. I just want to be entertained. Shows are always trying to teach us something, aren't they? And again, that's neutral, not neutral ground. What about, well, go back. What about radio? Talk radio. Music. Your friends. What kind of friends? How are they informing your thinking and your thoughts? Are you more like Christ because you've spent time with them? Are you less like him? Are you thinking better thoughts, things that are noble, things that are true, things that are beloved because you've spent time with those friends. Maybe you need new friends. That's not always. What? Technology, always technology. Sports, again, not neutral ground necessarily. Entertainment, news. News. In March of 2019, my wife and I discovered that our middle son, Daniel, who was named after Dan DeHaan, was very sick. A month later, after surgery, we discovered he had a very rare kind of cancer. And we didn't know at the time how aggressive it would be. But something happened to us at that moment. I, we used to watch the news. We watched the news on a regular basis. But at that moment, everything in our power, everything in our life began to focus upon our son and being with him. He's 36 years old. Being with him every moment, for six months, we never watched the news. Somebody said amen. <laughs> six months, never to watch the news. It didn't matter. It didn't matter what Trump was doing. It didn't matter what China was doing. It didn't matter what Turkey was doing. We could not care less what was happening because we were so focused and we were with him 24 hours every day, every day of the week. For the four months that he survived. He died in August of that year. Two months later, I turned back on the news. And you know what? Nothing had changed. Absolutely nothing had changed. In six months, the news was still the same. 
I would suggest to you, maybe watch a little less news. Because it's not honorable, it's not noble, it's not beloved. I'm not saying be misinformed. I'm just saying, what's informing your thinking? I'm asking that question. Environment, the environment that we have. Well, let's take a look. Here's the word finally. This is where, I love this little thing. Uh, Finally, brothers, the Greek word taloipan. Now, my Greek students are going to be happy today because I'm going to call them out. I'm going to ask them to stand. I'm not really. I'm going to ask them to stand up and read Greek. I'm not going to ask them to do that. But here's, here's, meet a new friend. His name is Stephen Runge. Stephen is the world expert on a field of study called discourse analysis. Now, discourse analysis is a field of study that recognizes something about language, and not just the Greek language or the English language, but all languages. And it's simply this, that when we begin teaching a language, we start at the very, the very smallest thing we can find. There's a letter. There's alpha, beta, gamma, delta, right? We start with that. And we start putting those together into syllables and into the words. But there's something above the word level. It's called a clause. It's called a phrase. But there's something above that level, and it's called a sentence. And there's something above that level, and it's called a paragraph. Remember paragraphs? Remember how to write a good paragraph? There's something above that level. It's called discourse. That there are markers in language that simply say more than what the words themselves say. So we were doing a podcast together here at the library. He was here with his sweet wife and we were talking about stuff. He's going to be coming back when uh, Bill Mounts comes in the spring, I think it is. For a lecture, but Steve is just a fantastic guy. He is very humble, very open, and he gave me an example in English. So here's an example in English if you want one. You're having a conversation with somebody, and they say, But anyway, but anyway, now what does that say? Think about it for a moment. If somebody's having a conversation, you're in a long conversation with somebody, and they say, but anyway, in other words, I'm getting back to what I meant to tell you in the first place. I've been sort of chasing a rabbit for a minute, but anyway, I'm going to get back to the, to the, to the point, to the real thing. I had a, I was a youth pastor many years ago at a church in Atlanta when I was growing up called Dunwoody Baptist Church. It was a great church. And I had a young person in my church. His name was Monty. I'm not going to tell you his last name because he may hear this. He drives a truck now. He's a, he's a great. He was one of my best young people in the church. Monty had this habit of talking sort of nonstop. You know people like that? I mean, just talk, 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 talk. Talk, 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 telling stories, just telling stories, telling me details. And I, and usually that was at church when I had stuff I had to, needed to do. And so he would be telling me a story and telling me a story and telling me a story. And I say, Monty, I've, I've got to go in to, to church now because I've got to read scripture. So I need to get ready for that. I'll see you in a little bit later. So he'd stop mid story. And I would come back out of the church, come walking up the, the aisle toward the back of the church and he would stop me and he would say but anyway (laughs) as if I had remembered anything he had just said an hour and a half ago but anyway but anyway is one of those markers that we have in language and Taloipan is sort of like that in a sense what he's saying here is Paul is saying now I'm transitioning I'm moving toward the end here I'm getting to to a really important point in the letter. And that's where we pick up in this particular passage. It's a discourse marker. You, you could simply translate it finally, but it's not really, I mean, he's already said that in chapter 3, verse 1, I think it is. He's already said that. He's really getting to the point now of an important point of the letter, and that is to recognize the gift in an important way of what the Philippians had done for him while he is in prison. Finally, now what he's doing is he's continuing the thought of the previous verse. The previous verse said, stop worrying. Remember, Mark talked about that last week. Stop worrying. Pray about everything. 
And don't forget to thank God in the midst of it. And the God, this God of peace and this supernatural peace will guard, it will stand century over your life. So I like this picture. This is actually from Turkey, what, where, where uh, unfortunately where Andrew Brunson was. I met him a few years ago at Wheaton College, a great man, great man, and a graduate of Wheaton College as well. This inner peace, he says, has something to do with us. Peace can be lost if we think about, if we focus on, if we concentrate on all the wrong things. And what he's doing, he's pulling together some features of Stoic philosophy that were common in the day, things that everyone could agree on. Bits and pieces. And he said, think about these noble things. Everyone can agree on them. Think about these honorable things. Everyone can agree on them. But he says, they are framed by the peace of God. So he begins with the peace of God, and he's going to end with the peace of God. And all of our thinking is to be thought within that framework of God's shalom, God's wholeness and wellness and beauty and truth and goodness that's available to all of us through Christ and in Christ. God is the one, he says, who brings peace. And God will be with you as you guard your thinking, as you guard your mind, and as you focus upon noble, beautiful, wonderful things. Well, here's, here's just, we're just going to go through a litany of some of the key words. Finally, brothers, whatever is true. Here's the Greek word, aleth, alethe. We'll come back here. I get to play. Here. Alethe. Now, my Greek students will recognize that Im immediately because they've had a, a similar word, aletheia, which means truth. This is the adjective form of that. Whatever is true, whatever is, let's see, here's our thing, genuine. Whatever is the right thing, the, the true thing, not a counterfeit thing. Whatever is a true thing, whatever is honest, think about those things. Keep thinking. Fix your mind upon those things. And he goes on to say, whatever is honorable. It's a very rare Greek word in Paul, simna. It means whatever is honorable also means dignified. Dignified thoughts. Elevated thoughts. High thoughts. I'm not talking about high academically. I'm talking about high morally thoughts. High moral thoughts. Think about those things. Whatever is honorable, fix your mind upon those things. Whatever is just, whatever is just, whatever is right, whatever is fair. These are big words today, aren't they? Justice. Well, this is not new. The scripture says this in the book of Deuteronomy. Justice, justice shall you pursue. Shall you all pursue. Not just judges, not just lawyers, not just people paid to do it. Everyone who is a part of the family of God is to pursue justice. That's what we're to do. But there's all this talk about different kinds of justice today, right? There's the phrase social justice. There's economic justice. There's racial justice. Oh, social justice again. That must have been the Braves. I think they must have scored right then. I think that, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, I just repeated myself. I said the same thing. I'm repetitive, sorry. And then environmental justice. Can you, you can probably come up with three or four on your own. And it's always some modifier with justice. Why isn't justice enough? Because if it's right, it's right for all. If it's true, it's true for all. If it's genuine, it's genuine for all. So I, it's not that we shouldn't use these words. It's just why modify them with something else? Usually it's just... There's, there's agendas that are there. We have to recognize what those are. But just simply do, say what Deuteronomy says. Justice, justice shall you pursue. All of us. We are to pursue what is right. Not only in our own lives, but also in the world around us. As we have the effect. Whatever is pure. I love this word. Hagna. It's a beautiful word. It just means 
pure. <laughs> you can't, there's not really any modifiers, it, it, different words there. It's just pure, unadulterated, clean, right, good. Picked up a glass this morning. I had my coffee on a table, I was drinking coffee. There was a glass right beside of it. I think it must have been there about three or four days. It had things growing in it. You ever, you ever did, you ever? It never happens at your house, I'm sure. We, I'm not as clean as I used to be. No, I'm not. Yeah, um, but, but I ended up, I was, I was working on, on the PowerPoint. I was trying to, trying to do some razzle-dazzle like Mark does. I can't do that. But I was trying to do a little razzle-dazzle. And uh, I kind of got, you know, focused upon that. And I, I reached over and picked up the wrong glass. And I brought it up. And, and, and I began, I tipped it up. And I looked in there and I saw something growing. And some things moving. And I don't know what they were, but I put it down pretty quickly. That's not pure. No, we are to drink. We want to put in ourselves pure water. Or in the, my case, coffee. Not exactly pure, but it's still good. It's still beautiful, right? The next word is, is in fact, that prosphile means beauty, it means attractiveness, attractive to all. It comes, at the root of it is the root of friendship and love. At the heart of it, and in fact, it's the root of the word kiss as well. The kiss. As Paul, remember, said to one another, greet one another with a holy kiss. Baptists don't do that much, but that's okay. Holy handshake will take care of it. Whatever is commendable, next word, whatever is worthy of admiration. Our word, here, here, here listen to this word, it's euphema. Euphema. Our word euphemism comes from that. You know what euphemism is, right? A euphemism is a, 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 an easier way to sort of listen to and digest something that's hard. Like when somebody dies, we might say they, they passed away. Or when somebody dies, they're, they're with the Lord now, right? Or they passed. Or they, we have other ways as well. But a euphemism is a, is a not, not so harsh way of saying something that really is a harsh reality of life. And so euphema is something that is, and for the Greeks, was worthy to be admired by all people. Not just a certain select group, but most people. Something to speak well about. And then there's, if there's any excellence, the Greek word for virtue. If there's anything virtuous, anything good, anything of moral excellence. If there's anything that is worthy of praise. There we go. It's kind of at the bottom, sorry. Braves must not have been doing so well at that point, I guess. Let too many Dodgers on the base. Praiseworthy, things that all human praise. Things which even Paul uses the word, that which God praises in us, in his people. It's a beautiful word. Let me ask you this. What are you thinking about lately? What does most of your mind go to? What's informing that? And I realize that we can't control all of our thoughts, but where are our minds fixed? Where are they focused? How are they focused? Paul says, keep thinking these things. Focus your mind upon those things. The God of peace is not likely to be able to hang around if our mind is focused upon sinful things, wrong things, hurtful things, gr grievous things. Pretty soon, peace is, sort of flies away. It's important that our mind be renewed. Mark talks about this all the time, that God is renewing our minds. He's renewing our minds in this direction, the direction of these things. Whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, commendable, excellent, worthy of praise. Think on those things. Now I know this is not easy. This is not natural. Human beings have certain tendencies that are not exactly focused upon those things. In the news business, they say if it bleeds, it leads. 
right? Imagine trying to have a news station of just good news. Not many people would tune in, doesn't seem like. So don't believe everything you think. You think some things, and our minds can trick us, but don't, th- don't believe just because you have a thought or somebody else has a thought that's informed you or you hear it from somewhere, don't just think that's true. I have some friends that are conspiracy theorists. They'll admit it to you. Some are young, some are a little bit older. But they listen to a lot of news in certain areas. And they end up thinking about how all of this is coordinated behind the scenes. Now, you know what? It it may be, but I sort of doubt it. I sort of doubt it. I don't focus upon those things. We shouldn't focus upon those things. Are there things wrong in the world? Yes. Let's name them. Let's face them and say, justice shall you pursue. Just name them. We don't have to think too hard about that. We know intuitively deep down if the Spirit is with us, what's right, what's good, what's true. So act theologically. Act theologically. As if God really does exist. Live your life. Some people, I I read a book a few years ago. I'm trying to remember the name of the person. He said, we are functional atheists. Because we live as if there is no God. We conduct our lives as if there is no God, except at, you know, times like this, when we're studying the Bible or going to church. We live as if there is no. Act theologically, think theologically, be informed, read theologically. Now, that doesn't mean that you got to go out and get a theology book and start reading. You can read a novel theologically. You can can think about it from the standpoint, what is the worldview here? Is it true? Is it good? Is it beautiful? And if it's not, maybe put it down and read something else. Think. Same thing with television. We used to, at Houston Baptist University where I taught, we used to have students watch commercials and to think theologically about the commercials they were watching. What are they trying to communicate? What are they trying to say? Is there really more for your life at Sears? Are there really more? Is the good life over there in the, in, the, in the hardware department? That's where I kind of think it is. Love hardware, hardware stores. Got that from my dad. It's a good place to get something from. Write theologically as you, as you write your letters, as you write your emails. Write as if there is a God in heaven. As if peace is residing over you. As you do your business. As Mark is in trial, I am sure that he is remembering what he said last week. That the Lord is near. Remember that the Lord is near. And that he sees, he hears, he's pulling for you. The God of peace will be. Live theology. We need a lived theology. Not just something for the textbooks. Not just something for Sunday, but something for every day of the week. That's what this passage is all about. Paul goes on to say this, that what you have learned, my Greek students are going to like that ending, emathete, they've seen that ending a lot, ete, 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 amen, ete, usi. Remember those endings? Remember that? And and next, parilabete. He's talking here about the language of tradition. Paul said, I have handed on what you have learned from me, what you have received from me. It's like handing on tradition. Now, tradition gets a bad name sometimes, but I want to suggest to you a different way of thinking about tradition. A good way, a positive way. Tradition is not the worship of ashes. It's the preservation of fire. That's what tradition is. We all need that fire. We all need that warmth in the hearth, don't we? We need it in our heart. We need it in our bones, Jeremiah said. I've got fire in my bones, he said. We need that fire. And we can find that very often in tradition. Now, tradition can become hard and sort of disconnected from life and such, but it doesn't have to be that way. 
There's more to it than we think. I wish I had more time to develop that. Paul said, what you've heard in me, heard from me, the things that you've heard, the things that you've seen in me, what you've learned, what you've received, what you've heard, what you've seen in me. He said, do those things. Practice these things. Keep on practicing these things. Now, this sounds a little strange, doesn't it? In our context, it does, because we're the people that say, don't put me on a pedestal. Don't watch me. Don't do what I do, do what I say. You've heard that? Your mom? Yeah. Mom say that. Dad say that. We're the persons that want to sort of hide. But Paul says, no, put me on that pedestal. Watch me. Watch me when I get up in the morning. Watch me as I go through the day. Watch me as I lay down at night. And you're going to see Jesus. Can we say that? We ought to be able to say that. Not, not just the apostle to the Gentiles. But we all, all ought to be able to say that because you know what? People are watching you. People are taking their, whether you want it to be true or not, you're on somebody's pedestal. Maybe as a grandma or a granddad or as a dad or as a, as a worker, a co-worker, you're on somebody's pedestal and they're watching you. That's a very human thing to do. So Paul says, Paul put himself up as an example. Look at me. Look at what I do. Look at how I speak. Look at how I act. And you're going to see Jesus. That's a remarkable thing. And it's so unlike us today. Watch me. Put me on a pedestal. And we will not go wrong. Well, I began looking at, and I think, I don't know if Janet, Janet's going to cover this or not in her hall of reason. But I began looking at what some social scientists were saying about humanity and human imitation. Uh, a growing number of cognitive scientists and anthropologists think that rather than making our living as innovators, now they're not think making our living, uh, that is our job, that is human beings just living and flourishing on the planet. He says, human beings survive and thrive precisely because we don't think for ourselves. Instead, people cope with challenging climates ecological context by carefully copying others so we do we do that all the time especially those and this is key those respect we respect instead of homo sapiens the man who knows the one who knows we're homo imitans man the imitator much of what our behavior and action and thinking is about is about imitating somebody else who are you imitating? Now, this is done at a very, almost a subconscious level. And it's done, scientists are discovering, not just in children. You know, how babies will sort of respond to you when you smile at them and they start smiling back. You remember that moment when that baby smiled and you were smiling at that baby and that baby smiled at you? Or you stuck out your tongue, Bleh. And they stuck out their tongue, oh, man, and they get all kind of instant reward for that because they see on their mom's face or dad's face or, 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 you know, grandparents' faces the joy that's there. Happens in kids. It happens at a very subtle level with language. With language. Um, most, most of you who grew up around these parts... Uh, probably have a similar accent. You learn to speak in a particular way. I remember when we moved, we, I grew up in Georgia. That's how they say that, Georgia, with a J, Georgia. We grew up in Georgia. That's where I'm from. Parents, uh, uh, grandparents, farmers. My, parent, my, my dad was a, a bookkeeper, not an accountant, but a bookkeeper. And when I moved here back in 1979, I had never heard anybody say light and bright before. Now, I knew the language. I knew what light and bright meant, but I had never heard that before. 
That's a, that's a regional accent. That's how you learn to speak. When we lived up in, uh, when Kathy and I lived up in the Midwest, almost immediately when I opened my mouth, they would say, you're not from around here, are you? <laughs> and I said, no, but you talk real funny. Because we grow up in a, with people and they speak a certain way and we imitate their language. And, and we, when we try to learn another language, it's a challenge because sometimes our tongues won't make those sounds. Because we weren't born in the Middle East. Or we weren't born in India or China, someplace like that. Learn those languages first. Notice, imitation can have sort of a bad reputation. But researchers say our species drive to imitate so readily is a significant mechanism through which we learn social norms. How do we live? How do we talk? What's normal? My, my grandson yesterday asked, asked, is it okay if I put my elbows on the table? Because I guess he heard from somewhere, you don't put your elbows on the table. I said, with us, it's okay. Enjoy that donut right? He doesn't get to eat donuts at home. I ask him, what have you been eating at home? He says, salad. <laughs> Mom feeds him salad all the time. Salad for breakfast. That's awful. <laughs> how we integrate into society, how we get together with other people, all of that is about, is, 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 is about, is about imitation. You're going to imitate somebody. You have been imitated. You, you may not know it, but you have been, and you are, and you will to your dying day. Researchers are looking more. Said, oh, well, it's true in children, of course, but not adults. No, it's true of adults, too, as well. I mean, adults do it. What time is it? Oh, 1020. Adults do it just as much as kids, maybe more so. Not long ago, I was, I was down at town at, at a big meeting that Mark has with lawyers, Mark lawyers it's called the trial academy and I was in among about a thousand lawyers I'm not a lawyer but I tell you what I have never seen so many pocket squares in my life all those lawyers had pocket squares all colorful waving at you some of them squared off some of them in little they all had pocket squares I left after two days of that and I found myself on Google <laughs> looking for pocket squares. It wasn't a conscious thought. It just happened. Pretty soon I was on Amazon. Went down to Amazon looking for pocket squares. Lawyers look good in pocket squares. I, I put them in my, my, my basket. You know, the basket that you get ready to buy stuff with? I put it in my basket. And um, I, I almost got ready to hit the purchase. And then I came to myself like the prodigal son. I said, you're not a lawyer. You don't make lawyer money. You're an academic. You ever seen an academic with a pocket square? Never. Never. A bow tie, yes. Not a pocket square. We subtly do these things all the time. Somebody says, listen, have you heard this album? It's a great album. No, I'll listen to it. Oh, I like their music. Now, this is how it happens in humans. It's pretty simple. We are hardwired to imitate. It's not something we do consciously. It just happens. It happens with our language, the words that we use. I remember hearing for the first time the other day, well, two years ago now, the word woke. Right? The word woke. And now everybody uses that word. And the other day I was talking with some friends. I said, that's really far out. Now some of you remember John Denver. And now on his TV show he'd say, far out. I like that. I picked that up. We all do those things, kind of things. Language. The way we dress. Not just pocket squares, but other things. How we dress. The music that we like. The books that we read. I was with some friends the other day in Nashville, and, and, and I said, you know, you gave me this series of books to read, and it was wonderful. I thank you. And I said, hey, here's another. Here's another series we, we like. And I said, oh, yeah, I like you. You're my friends. I respect you. I, you have good reading taste. You've been an editor for 30 years of your life. You know what good literature is. 
So where did you get those sneakers? They're Jordans. Oh, man, I got to have them. Everybody's buying them. Everybody's buying them. Well, like father, like son is the expression. All right? And here's how it works in humans. It's very simple. First of all, we respect someone. We look at them, and for whatever reason, we admire them. Maybe they're a family member. Maybe they're just a friend. Uh, maybe they're a co-worker. But we know someone that we respect. That, that it starts off with respect and admiration. Second, we witness them behaving in a certain way. We do it all the time. We, we, we see something. And it seems to us to be attractive, something good, something that connects us to that person. And we desire to be like them. We want to be like them. And so we imitate them. And again, I want to suggest to you it starts in very subtle ways, almost unthoughtful ways, before it reaches the level, the conscious level. But it begins to happen. I can't tell you how many people have told me as they've gotten into middle age, I promised I'd never be like my dad, but I'm just like him, right? The other day I was doing something and Kathy said, that's just like your mom. You sounded like your mom when you said that. I didn't mean to. It just happens. And so imitations, there's the pedestal. Are you on that pedestal where you are for somebody? I don't know who it is. Paul does not say, I am setting myself up as an example of moral perfection. He doesn't do that. It's not what he's saying here. He directs them first in the letter to the book of, Colo of, of uh, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5. Though he was in the form of God, he chose not to cling to equality with God. But he poured himself out to fill a vessel brand new. A servant in form, a man in deed, the very likeness of humanity. He humbled himself, obedient to death, a merciless death on the cross. So God raised him up to the highest place and gave him a name above all. So when his name is called, every knee will bow in heaven, on earth, and below. And they will confess, Jesus the Messiah is Lord to the glory of God the Father. And he said, have that mind in you, the mind of Christ. Before Paul ever says, imitate me, follow me, watch me, do what I do, say what I say, and you will be like Jesus. Before he does that, what he says is have the mind of Christ who humbled himself and gave himself for us. Elsewhere, Paul says, be imitators of me. Because I am imitating Christ. I'm doing my best to imitate Christ. And if you know me, now I wish I had time to develop this a little bit, little bit more. Because there's all sorts of interesting stuff about moralist ethics from the ancient world. About the role of imitation and how important imitation is. Not only of people that you know, but people that you can read about. In good literature of the day. Imitate. Mimetai mum genesthe. Imitate me because I also am an imitator of Christ. This is Paul's admonition to us. So what you've received, what you've heard, what you've learned in me, do those things and the God of peace will be with you. I'm afraid I'm out of time. Here's some points to ponder. You've got homework. Here's your homework. Fix your mind on truth, goodness, and and beauty wherever it's found. When you find yourself angry at somebody and grieving against somebody, when you find yourself being, your mind being co-opted by something that is not true and good and beautiful, replace it. You can't just push it off the table. You got to replace it with something that is that, good, and true, and beautiful. And then find somebody to watch. Find somebody to watch. I hope you have somebody. Somebody that you admire. Somebody you respect. And watch what they do. And if they are imitators of Paul, and if Paul is imitating Christ, you're going to find yourself imitating Christ and your mind being transformed by the renewing of your mind and your life being conformed to the life of Christ. That's what's going to happen. 
realize that somebody else is watching you. They're taking notes. Maybe not on a real notepad, but on an unconscious sort of way. They're taking notes of you and the rest of us. Be someone worthy of imitation. Become that. If you're not that, now become it. You can through the power of God in Christ. And rejoice that God's peace is going to rest with you in that. I wish I had more time, but I, I see we're about out of it. Let me pray for us. We're going to go. We're going to go worship. Time for worship. We're going to go worship the one true living God. But let me, before you do, let's, let's pray together. Father, I thank you for these men and women, both those that are here and those that are watching on the internet and around the world. And I pray and I ask that you will be, your, your peace will be a guardian of their hearts and lives. And that they will learn what it means to fix their thoughts on what is good and true and pure and honorable and commendable and excellent. Father, help us. Our minds are so often carried away into thoughts that are hurtful, that are damning, that undo us. And we cry out, woe is me. Help us to move from woe is me to a new centered life in Christ. And I pray that we will be people worthy of watching because we know that people do just what people do. We ask it in the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen.